Chapter 18 They were drawing weirwood. Mary sat at her horse with the rest of the field, perched on the high shoulder of land beyond Hawcomb's head. She felt very alone, despite the huge numbers of riders waiting all around her, and the crowds of followers whose cars and land rovers were lined up along the narrow road that led to Axford. Edward was beside her, her father not far away. Mr. Yendel and scores of other farmers were out that morning, and a great many other hunting folk besides. Indeed, it looked as if half the countryside had flocked here to attend the final meet. The sun was shining, and there was a festive air about the gathering, a feeling of confidence. Down in the coombe, amongst the scrubby woodland, she could hear an occasional note of the horn and a hound's yipping voice across the valley. Still as statues sat her master and the whipper in, their red coats brilliant against the green and purple of the moor, waiting to see what deer broke covert. Edward was talking to her, but she did not listen. She strained her eyes for any sign of movement at the edge of the woodland. She was desperate to get a view of the stag. Two deer broke cover, graceful shapes of burnished russet bounding through fern. One was young, a mere pricket, but the other carried the head of a warrantable stag. There was a flash of lemon, and white as a tuft fastened on their line. Then another, one of the hounds gave tongue, a weird yelping note. But the huntsman rode after them and stopped them, turning them back into the covert. Though they had a runnable stag on foot, he would not do, it seemed. The real quarry must still be laid up in the coombe. Hounds and huntsmen disappeared again amongst the trees. Mary's uneasiness grew. The hounds were speaking again. There followed the high yell announcing a view. A tremor of expectation ran through the crowd. Even so it was a surprise when the great stag presented himself, coming out near the head of the coombe and standing in full view of everybody. The shock of it hit Mary like a blow, driving all thought from her at that moment. She heard a growling sigh of pleasure rise from hundreds of throats she heard voices crying there there it's the black one blood curdling yells split the air the stag surveyed them she saw his brown eye his defiant bearing the proud carriage of his head and the antlers she had clutched so often she saw the strong black of their steed the rough blackened coat of her deer and she trembled and cried out she could not help it. Here was her midnight visitor, the strange master of her dream, being driven from darkness into light of the, an ordinary day and forced to stand before a mob of dogs and men. I know, said Edward, mistaking her cry. Isn't he a tremendous brute? He should give us some good sport. The stag gathered himself and stretched away, starting down towards the weirwater. Over on Mill Hill, the master fluttered his handkerchief and the blue van that held the pack was sent for, and came quickly up. Meanwhile the whipper inn stopped the tufters, the stag had his law, and was gone from sight, galloping away with an easy action, heading towards Kittuck and the open moor. The hounds were unkennelled and brought along the green path, dipping down into the weir water, where on the far side the master and the whipper inn waited with the tufters. The hounds were laid on the line of the stag, whimpering with pleasure. They struck the foil and sang out with a great clack crash of voices, flinging their sterns as they ran. The hunt pounded after them, surging up the steep slope. But Mary hung back. She could not bear to hunt the black stag, and beside, despite Jim's promise, she was tortured by doubt. She had to see Jim without delay. She needed to have him beside her. She had to hear his voice and know he was safe. There was a clump of woodland running up a narrow coombe on the east side of the weirwater, and it was there she hid, waiting amongst the shadows until the sounds of the hunt faded. Then she turned her mount and picked her way back towards Hawkeum Head, moving as fast as she dared take the horse. Once on top, she used a whip on Sergeant, driving him into a gallop that took her across the Exford Road and down the dusty track to look at. From there she struck out for Pool Farm, dipping down one steep side of the coombe and labouring up the other to reach Stoke Perot. With Sergeant labouring and sobbing as he breasted Stoke Ridge, from there it was downhill to the farm and she drove the horse along at a punishing rate for the last mile, using heels and crop, till she reached the stone barns 
of Cloutsum and flung herself out of the saddle. Sergeant stood with heavy flanks and lathered neck about foundered. She left him and ran to the house. There was sweat trickling out of her hair and taste of dust in her mouth. She burst into the kitchen and saw Mrs. Yendall sitting quietly in a chair, her hands folded on in her lap. Where's Jim? she gasped. Mary, what a state you're in. You must calm yourself. Where's Jim, Mrs. Yendall? There was a pause. Mrs. Yendall looked at her steadily. It don't do no good to get excited, she said. Tell me, tell me where he is. Mary raised her hunting crop. If you don't tell me... Mrs. Yendall shrugged, as if what was said could not matter. He's upstairs, resting. With a moan of dismay, Mary ran up the wide staircase and along the corridor to Jim's room. It might still be all right, she told herself as she flung open the door, but one glance was enough to destroy her hopes. He lay propped against the head of the bed, his face white and shining. She remembered this pallor from before. She remembered the blankness too, the aching absence. She knew what it meant. Jim, she screamed, shaking him. You've got to wake up. She threw her arms round him and kissed his pale lips. She cradled him in her arms, sobbing and shouting his name. She tugged his hair and even forced his eyelids open, but none of it was any use. He had gone too far away from her to reach him. She pleaded with him and shook him, but he lay in her arms like a doll, and she became frantic. She went on shaking him, calling his name, time and time again, hardly knowing what she was doing any more, repeating herself with an obstinacy that was only one step from complete despair. All night Jim had fought against the appeals of the stag, all night he had refused to answer the call of the wild music, all night he had evaded the hooks of pleasure that were trailed in him in the deep waters of his being. By morning he felt worn out, but he reckoned he had won a decisive victory. Mrs. Yendall took one look at him, when she brought his tea and urged him to stay in his room and rest for the day. He didn't look himself, she said. She'd bring him up a bite of breakfast on a tray, and he could take things easy. He was glad to fall in with her suggestion. He needed to be alone. He couldn't afford to be distracted now. The events of the night had proved him stronger than the stag, but he knew there might be other assaults, and that would need all his reserve to withstand them. He felt confident that he would win, though through even if his success was also a sadness to him how mistaken he was sometime that morning the stag ceased to dally with him he saw in a moment that what he had repulsed so far had been no more than loving invitations now in a moment of crisis the stag put out its power he was summoned by an enormous voice that boomed through his hollows of his body he cowered under the force of the command like a mouse under the shadow of a buzzard there was no more resistance possible. The buzzard stooped and carried him off in its claws, the talons fastened into his flesh like hooks. He was entered, pierced, violated. He felt the fierce surge of blood in his veins. The wild music swelled so monstrously that he was almost obliterated by it. There was a smothering embrace, a raging welcome. He had entered a furnace in which he was almost burnt away. He struggled to hold on to some scrap of independence, but he was nearly gone. It was so hard to think, such labour. He kept lapsing into the dark blankness, and stutter kept falling before his eyes, and it took a desperate effort to force the shutter back, even a little way. The power and fury of the hunted stag burnt round him, like a huge fire. He was scared by the heat and blinded by the smoke. It was a torment to remain apart. He longed to give himself to the fire and be one with it, but there was an obdurate centre, a tiny point of consciousness that still struggled to survive. Think, it urged, think or you'll die. But he could hardly think at all. He looked through the stag's eyes, he could manage that, he could see things, but he could no longer put them together properly. He could see hooves, a green expanse, where was it? His mind could not answer, it blacked out again rather than make the effort. He accepted the pictures without examining them, holding on to that much. Green shaky mosses, pale cotton grass, boggy ground, nasty gutters. He knew to run amongst them, just as he knew to run through a patch of spiky gorse, but he did not understand why he knew. A building lay ahead, beyond it the ground dropped steeply, and in the hollow there was water. The stream called to him, and he went down and soiled in a pool. 
The water struck him a cold, brilliant blow along the flanks, and the chill of it seemed to help him think. He knew this place. He knew it. He knew the building above. He wrestled with the memory. It was a farm. Warren Farm, yes, the knowledge burst over him. He felt immensely thankful to have remembered. He was in the valley of the X, and must have come to it over Pinford Bog. The moment of achievement was followed by languor. The stag lay in the pool and did not want to move. Jim tried to force it up, but he could not, and the ominous nature of the, his creature came home to him. It could not rule the stag, he was lost. If he could not rule the stag, he was lost. His only hope was to get himself away. He must get himself back to Yendel's farm. He began the torture of trying to disentangle himself. But at that moment, distant sounds of the pursuit reached the stag's ears. And a new pall of smoke and darkness rolled over Jim as the stag bounded wildly to his feet and began to run the stream. As his consciousness slipped away, Jim fought desperately to hang on to the other idea, get back to the farm. The words were still being spoken in the stag when there was no longer any human voice left to pronounce them. The stag struck up the valley and mounted the rise towards Hillhead Cross. There, on the Exford Road, he was confronted by a glittering row of cars. The stag was afraid and would have bletched at this barricade of metal and goggle-eyed humans, but some echo of Jim's insistence lingered in him, enough to ensure that the stag did not swerve but ran straight at the cars. He cleared the hedge and went straight over a car bonnet in one huge leap, then galloped on to Hall Moor, still running strongly, though his head was dropping lower by the time he reached it, and there was a stabbing in his chest that had begun after the jump. The stag did not remember the jump. It was lost in the smoke of panic. He could give no reason for the pain. He accepted it, just as he accepted the aches that had grown in his muscles and the weary weight of his head. Reasons no longer presented themselves. All that mattered was the sweep of land that was running over now, a green and purple broken by a litter of white rocks. There was also a dim knowledge of the thing behind, more a pleasure of fear than a distant image. A sense of some huge, shapeless beast, yowling and snuffling, coming after him, drumming its iron hooves, throwing its many tongues in the distance. The stag laboured over Dunkery, and saw more human figures waving their arms on the beacon at its summit. Down he went, away from them, plunging through the heather, with the cool breeze from the sea blowing on his face, down into Sweetery Coombe, where there were tall trees and shadows and ravishing scents of water. The stag was reeling now, staggering along with his neck stretched out. Old age had suddenly descended on him. His tongue was thick and slack and dry as rope. His stride was broken. His sight had almost gone. He was spent. He blundered on to lie in the sh shallows of the east water, soiling wearily. But again the flow of the stream, the touch of that cold, sliding element, brought back some of his strength. He roused himself hearing the approach of the thing, but was uncertain what to do. In his stricken bones he sensed that the time had almost come when he must turn and face what followed him. He could still make a stand, even though he could not run. Soon he must turn and meet his destiny. The stag began to walk along the bed of the stream, scrambling among boulders, searching for a pool where he could stand at bay. But then, like bubbles escaping from the mouth of a drowned man, Jim's words rose out of the blackness. Get back to the farm. The stag listened, and in his weakness and perplexity he obeyed the command. But first his instincts forced him to double up and down the stream so as to confuse the hounds. Then he summoned up his strength and jumped clear of the bank into a patch of fern and briar. These stratagems had been at the command of his kind for thousands of years. As he toiled up the steep slope towards Cloutsham, he sniffed the air, seeking for signs of other deer, so that, if possible, he might strain his, stain his scent with theirs. But there were none about. He forced himself on, dragging up the steep slope, until finally he reached the farm and stood looking at the door. Baffled, grappling with a different impulse which demanded that he go absolutely against his nature and break his way into his human den. Mary was still sitting in a daze of grief, with Jim's head cradled 
in her arms, when the silence was shattered by a huge noise outside. The window below, something was beating on the door. The noise came again, like the stroke of a sledgehammer. The whole house resounded at the blow. Mary ran to the window and looked out. She saw the black stag in the yard, lathered and desperate, kicking at the timbers of the door. As she watched, he pushed with his shoulder and levered with his head, straining horribly. She heard his antlers rattle on the wood, but apart from that, his he laboured in silence. Then he stood back and raised his head, as if he had sensed her presence. The gazed, glazed eyes met hers in a dead stare, and then his head sank back as he muttered the remnants of the deep roar, which was his only sound. What crept out from his throat was a low, rattling groan. Mary looked from the beaten stag to the motionless figure of Jim sprawled on the bed. She heard a horn note and the questing voices of hounds down in the valley. She could guess what was happening. The pack must have checked at the east water and now the huntsman was making a wide cast with the hounds up and down the stream. She threw a last glance, to glance towards the pale shining face of the figure on the bed and love for him turned into turned in her heart like a knife. She ran downstairs to where Mrs. Yendall was still sitting, hands folded in her lap, motionless. "'Can't you hear?' cried Mary, her voice breaking the stag. "'He's outside.' As if in answer, another huge blow was struck on the door. "'They'll come for him,' said Mrs. Yendall, in a drained voice. "'Bide still, still, my dear.' "'We've got to stop it. We must go and call off the hunt.' Mrs. Yendall looked at Mary from a great distance. Then she smiled bleakly. And that was all. He'll die if we don't. He'll die. Yes, said Mrs. Yendall evenly. The stag will die. Not the stag, Mary was sobbing. I mean Jim. There was another appalling crash as the stag threw his weight against the door. Mrs. Yendall did not challenge Mary's strange words. She sat impatiently. Then she said, These things happen. It's not of our choosing. What do you mean? Mary was frantic. It's been his own choosing. Tis a bargain struck. "'and there's nothing can be done.' "'You know,' cried Mary aghast, "'you know about it. "'Oh, God in heaven, help me! "'We've got to stop them!' "'She started to pull at the older woman's arms, "'but Mrs. Yendall would not move. "'What do I know?' said Mrs. Yendall bitterly. "'I know nothing. "'And what'll you tell them? "'Do you think the hunters will listen? "'There's nothing you can do to stop them now. "'Tis played out nearly to its end. "'I've got to.' What will you do? Run to the police, phone up the newspapers, they'll laugh at you, all of them. Such things can't happen, they'll say. The girl's hysterical, she is mad. We all know such things can't happen, so there's nothing to be done. Not by you, nor me, nor any woman. This is not a thing for women. The stag's weight burst against the door again. Let it be, said Mrs. Yendall. It's not for us to think we can meddle in such affairs. I tell you, it is not a thing for women. You must learn to bide still and bow your head. No, cried Mary, I can't. Soon the horsemen and the hounds would come up the hill and find her stag, her darling, and she could not bear it. He had to be saved. Jim must be saved. Even if he had chosen, it had been done out of love and pride. Why must it end in slaughter? What kind of world was this that made such cruel judgments of its creatures? She would fight against the verdict with all her might. But what could she set against it? There was nothing except herself. But how? She racked her brains. How had the change come about? Where had it become? What was the secret, the root of the power? Suddenly, hearing the furious rattle of the stag's antlers on the door, she knew the answer, and she was running, running till there was not enough breath in the world for her needs, running till her lungs almost burst, and she snatched... At burning mouthfuls of air, running, running, along the bridge path to the old tumble-down cottage, she burst through the tangled garden and entered the musty stillness of the parlour, with its settle and its bed of dying ferns, and in the cupboard under the stairs, that other thing. She dragged open the cupboard door and saw the helmet straddling its tabernacle, the harsh curve of the iron and the wicked antlers gleaming like spears. Surely it had grown bigger. She bent down and heaved the helmet out, trembling at the monstrous weight of it in her hands. Resistance flowed from the pronged male crown like a sullen heat. Who was she? asked a booming voice in her head. Who was she, a woman, to break in on this mystery? She felt weak and dizzy and would have dropped the helmet but for the memory of Jim lying on the bed with death in his face and the stag beating desperately on the locked door. She fought to raise the helmet over her head, 
Her arms ached cruelly, and sweat broke out on her brow. The hostility of the helmet burnt like a fire. She was afraid, and her flesh winced. Nevertheless, she drove the helmet down onto her head. There was a surplus of fire gripping her temples, a crown of glowing iron that seemed to scorch her whole being. She whimpered, longing to tear the helmet off, but she fought the impulse down. Suddenly the world changed. Mary was in a cave where firelight flickered on bare rock. Out of the smoke and ruddy darkness at the far end of the cave stepped the huge figure of a man with antlers springing from his head. She had never seen him before, and yet she knew him. She even knew his smell, made up of the odours of fur and earth and sweat and crushed fern. She knew she would cower before him, the only, that only by submitting would she find rest. She reeled, fighting against her instincts, all the buried law of her nerves, but somehow she managed to keep her feet and stay upright. The horned man began to dance, as if he did so at a pack of red-eared hounds, ran round him and gave tongue with a crash of iron voices the horn man was tempting mary he was wooing her through the steps of his dance asking her to tell him what would quench the fire that burnt her she knew the answer it was blood she knew it but she would not give it even though she understood the answer would bring her peace of a sort the horn man whirled round her dancing to a wild music his actions became more urgent and the hounds gathered in a ring snarling at her bearing yellow fangs still she would not give way she held out against the dancer though she was almost beaten down by his brutal arrogance his animal power then she sensed the change in the movements of the dancer his feet were still carrying him through the ritual steps but now he was being forced into the dance against his will the music lapsed into discord as the first question was dragged out of him what sanctifies the lone the holy man boomed a hollow voice Mary knew the answer he wanted, but again she would not give it. She cast about desperately. There was another answer to this riddle. Then she found it in a memory of Jim, lying defenceless on the bed. Love, she cried, and it was like inflicting a wound upon herself. The dancer reeled for a moment, but the dance had to go on. He could not escape from it. He whirled faster, driven by a gale of wild music. What is, an old, what is as old as the sea? came his question. Love. Each time she voiced the word, Mary felt her word, wounds gape wider. The dog snapped at her, roused by the thought of blood. What is this flower of sacrifice? groaned the dancer. Love. She could feel the first fang sink into her flesh. What is stronger than death? Love. The dogs were on her. What is the food of the god? The dancer was staggering drunkardly. He too was suffering. The music screeched and blared. Love. What is the heart of the mystery? The dancer's face was twisted in a grimace of pain. He yearned now, he begged her for help, and the music pleaded in a sad, in ha sad harmonies, but Mary held out against this too. It was her turn to be remorseless. She had to defend them with the cruelty of love. Love, she answered, and the dogs bore her down and swarmed over her, but she still had not submitted. What seals the great bargain? The dancer's voice was strangled, his limb, limbs moved slowly, like a man under water. Love, she shrieked, as the dogs tore her apart, and rooted in her vitals, hunting her very soul. The questioning was over. The dancer stood, motionless, as a painted figure, but the dogs still bathed her round. She had lost, she thought, pulled down, violated, broken as she was, she must have lost. Yet she still struggled to save Jim, and with the last of her being she shouted, I'll take it on myself, forever if I must, me for him. Suddenly she was back in the cottage. It was daylight, and the room was empty. She stood there, feeling she had won f free. Then, with a rending noise, the iron band that circled her he head broke and sprang apart. The antlers sprung loose in their sockets and the helmet fell and shattered on the floor from the broken antlers there leaked a black dust that spread in little pools on the stone seats it looked like old blood the weight had gone from mary the spell was broken the helmet lay in ruins and she was unharmed only when she ran wearily, wearily back along the ridge path and heard the mort being blown did she become afraid that what had happened might have come about not through the power of love, after all, but through the power of death.
She blundered past the groups of dismounted hunters and the pack of muddy hounds, flinching as she caught sight of the stag lying broken on the stones of the yard. She ran up the stairs and burst open the door. Jim was sitting on the side of the bed. He was alive. Jim stood in the doorway and looked at She stood in the doorway and looked at him. Their eyes met, but they said nothing. His face was still pale and shining, but as she watched, the radiance began to fade. "'Come here,' said Jim, after a while. She went over to him. "'Luke,' he said. She followed his gaze. The mirror showed their faces side by side, and both were marked by the same shining, unearthly pallor. "'It's gone,' he said. "'I can feel it's gone.' Even now his relief was touched with the sadness of knowing that never again would he be allowed to taste such pride and strength and fiery innocence as had been given him by the stag. "'It's over,' said Mary, "'for us.' She spoke soberly. Jim was safe, but only Jim. The dancer was not dead, and he could assume many different shapes. Mary took Jim's hand and held it. Outside in the yard, the hunters followed the ancient rites of dismemberment. They bloodied the hounds with the paunch of their victim. Down in the deep woods of the Horner Valley, hidden from man, the wild red deer lay, waiting for nightfall. Ringing their horizon, like a dark fume in the air, there rose the smoke pole of Wolverhampton and all the cities like it in the world. The End